James Swanick here, and today we are going to be talking about healthy habits. We're going to be talking about being an entrepreneur, talking about having healthy colleagues or healthy team members in your organization. We're going to be talking about productivity tips and some sleep tips. Uh, and today our guest is Mr. Rex Miller, who is an entrepreneur and the author of The Healthy Workplace Nudge. How Healthy People, Culture, and Buildings Lead to High Performance. And uh, Rex uh, has, is known for turning what he describes as hopelessly stuck situations into transformation uh, and growth. I'm assuming with um, uh, not just organizations and companies, but on a, on a human being individual level as well. Sure. Starts there. One, but- yeah, if you can transform one person, you can transform an entire organization, right? Rex right. Miller, great to have you here, sir. Yeah, thank you, James. I'm a big fan and I appreciate it. In fact, I'll start out with these that I wear every single night when we do our digital sunset. Oh, nice. Why don't you throw, throw a pair on now just so we can see just okay, for a second. Uh-huh. There we go. We've got the fit overs that go nice and snug over the uh, over your existing glasses. That's right. Yeah, I've had these for a little over a year and a half now. Ah, oh, wonderful. Great. Thanks for showing those off. You bet. So just tell us a little bit about what you do, Rex. Well, I'm in consulting and I evolved out of project delivery, large construction projects, and looked at the dynamics of teams. And then out of that began seeing the same dysfunctions in teams and companies and culture. So it was an evolution of being frustrated with just how terrible most construction projects are in terms of friction and conflict, and it continued to evolve. So now our consulting firm works with personal performance, team performance, and organizational performance. Yeah, wonderful. And if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, just go ahead and type in where you're watching from at the moment. And if you have a question as we go along, please do uh, ask that question of of Rex. Excuse me one second. Sure. (laughs) Thank you very much. Just need to... Uh, get that out over and done with. Early morning where I'm recording this at the moment, Rex, Brisbane, uh, Brisbane Australia, 7 o'clock in the morning, a little Very bit chilly good. here in a winter's yeah. morning. Um, so, yeah, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, please do post a question for Rex now as it relates to either your sleep or your performance or how to get the most out of uh, team, that whether that be colleagues or staff in your organisation. So, what were some of the big things that were disrupting a team's performance that you identified, Rex? Well, primarily, it's the different viewpoints everybody has. On a construction project, for example, the owner has one view of how the project should go, the architect, the contractor. They all speak different languages. They all have different contract and, and um, compensation structures. So when you bring all of that together, the system we determined is designed to create distrust, fragmentation. And then, you know, in in the Bible, the very first construction project, the Tower of Babel, was the first project that was over budget and late. So it's been happening ever since. What we found is that most of the time it was communication, how how you're wired differently than me. And if we could begin there and begin to build the bridges in terms of the difference in the way you're wired and the difference in the way I'm wired and appreciate those two, uh, then we can begin to move towards what we call being effective versus being right. And those are the choices. Do you want to be effective or do you want to be right? Because we all feel righteous about our position, but we have a very limited view of everything that's going on. So we need to build those bridges of trust to be able to work through and create early collaborative trust-based teams was pretty much the shift that we took in the construction area. How many different personalities or different ways of looking at the same thing are there in the world? Like human beings, if we break human beings up into little groups, how many different types of viewpoints (laughs) or personality types do we have? As many as there are people. You know, we use the Clifton Strengths. And what makes the Clifton strengths a little bit different than others, it's called a psychometric tool. It's measuring your strongest neural pathways. And it's a proxy for your natural strengths or your talents. And um, 
And so in the top five, they measure 34 of them and they rank order them in terms of their strength. The philosophy is that you do better playing to your strengths than trying to fix weaknesses. And so uh, the results focus on the top five. There's 33,600,000 combinations of those top five. Um, and it matters. It matters the rank order. It matters the relationship between, for example, strategic is my top strength. Uh, achiever is my second. If I had, if somebody else had strategic as their number one, and let's say they had relator, you know, deep trust as number two, it would look completely different. Um, in 2005, there was a company called Core Clarity that created a system that was a lot like a deck of cards, color-coded system that helped take all these varieties and make it a little easier to work with. And so we use those two when we work with project teams, companies, and cultures. Mm. There's other ones, aren't there, like the disk profile and things like that? Yeah, they're all good. They all do different things. And that's where people really need to look at. Disk is really about communication style. Myers-Briggs is really about how you like to make decisions. Uh, Clifton Strengths is what your natural talent is and how to play to your strengths. Uh, there's the big five. There's lots of really good tools. The key is uh, to use it for what it was designed to do and not over apply it. Is there an argument to say that if you uh, are putting together a project that you would just hire people who have a very similar personality style to you and talk the same mm -hmm. language and think the same way versus hiring people who are completely different personality style, completely different communication style. Right. Well, so the research shows that the particular wiring that you or I have doesn't determine what role we'll be best at. That's using the Clifton strengths. Now, there are others that determine kind of role and function, but it determines how we will be successful. So you can imagine a very personable, outgoing doctor, but you can also imagine one that's very uh, kind of analytical and reserved. So when we come to teams, first of all, it's just the luck of the draw. You, you can't predetermine who you're going to have an opportunity to talk to and pick. So good teams pick the best talent with the right values fit. And then you use the analytics of the tools to figure out uh, how to best play to that team's natural strengths. And then you look at where the natural gaps are and you work around that. Uh, that's much more effective than hoping you get all the right, perfect kinds of people with the right talents and strengths. Uh, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we don't look for, just like any team, if you need a wide receiver in, in football uh, or the equivalent uh, specialty player in soccer or rugby, you look for that particular uh, set of skills or talents. But in general, you just pick the best people you can and then you do the analytics to figure out how to play to that team's natural strengths. And when you're talking about you do the best analytics, so uh, as a matter of course, when you when hiring someone or even if entering into a romantic relationship of any kind, I would imagine as well, is it, uh, do you suggest literally going through one of these tests, whether it be Clifton or DISC or it could be the five love languages uh, if you're yeah. in a romantic yeah. partnership? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very much so. I mean, we would avoid a lot of the oh, I wish I would have known that before conversations if we had a little bit of wiring. <clears throat> and so in my role in corporate, I am typically, typically brought in when something goes sideways, a team's not functioning well, a project goes south. And then we begin, in to, begin to do the assessment. We say, oh, that's why you really dial in on the numbers or the details, or that's why you come in with an inspirational statement every every day. Um, you'd like to work that out in practice ahead of time, just like a sports team. You know, you don't wait till the game day to begin working on stress or un unpredictable situations. You You practice that ahead of time so that when you're in that heat of the moment, uh, you've got the playbook, you've done the practice, and now it's instinctive rather than chaotic. We're talking to Rex Miller about 
uh, personality types and how to get your project running nice and smoothly, utilizing the different personality and communication styles of the team members. Uh, Rex is the author of the book, The Healthy Workplace Nudge, How Healthy People, Culture, and Buildings Lead to High Performance. And we're going to give away a couple of copies of the book. Uh, if you'd like to uh, be in the running for the book, leave a comment or ask a question during the live and towards the end we'll pick uh, a couple of people there and we'll uh, we'll make sure we get your details and we'll send you off uh, one of Rex's books now um, what tell, tell give us a little anecdote if you would Rex of mm -hmm. the worst or one of the worst organizations or teams that you saw you don't need to, to name them the, the right. particular organization but an example of something that was just horrendously working or not working dysfunctional, and then how they were managed to uh, able to turn it around. Well, uh, I'll briefly reference two. I'll go into detail on one of them. The first one, my son, who was traveling with me right out of uh, high school for a few years. Uh, this was a startup company in Southern California, and there were five strong founders. I mean, strong, strong founders that could not get along. Uh, around three in the afternoon, two of them stepped out and got into a literal fist fight. Um, now it helped now under, you know, this was startup culture. So they didn't get up until 10 or 11 in the morning. They broke out whiskey about three or four in the afternoon. So the whiskey kind of helped get the truth out. Uh, one of the founders asked if I was going to break it up. And I said, no, actually it saved me about six months of trying to figure out what the real problem is. So uh, that was one. The other was a very large industrial project. It was budgeted at $350 million and it was $100 million over budget with about another eight months to a year to go. Wow. Um, that was totally at odds. And uh, I brought one of my colleagues with me. We typically don't go into these situations alone because the consultant can oftentimes become the projected object of the of, of the, the anger, you know, we become the proxy for whatever the issues are. Um, so in that, we did one of the profiles and we found that the general, uh, the project manager and the general superintendent were wired so differently that when they were looking at the same uh, problem, the project manager, the head of the job was thinking that the general superintendent was insubordinate. When all that was really happening is he was very internal and cognitive, took a lot of time to think and come to a conclusion. The other person had none of the cognitive strengths and they were all the do it now kind of strengths. So it was really tough, but we finally got them to see where the difference was. And then the project manager just started saying when, he, when it hit him, he says, man, I've effed up. And he just said it over and over and over again. Uh, they had a reconciliation that went to the group. Uh, the executive that flew in for this looked and said, how, how in the world did this turn around? And again, it was, you know, we're so wired to think and take for granted that the way we see it is the way everybody else does. And in the heat of the moment, we double down on that. And we had a moment of being able to show visibly the difference. And when you can show something you know, visibly or tangibly, it can sometimes build a bridge. That was one of the most dramatic turnarounds that I was involved in. Rex, when you're out at a dinner party, for example, or you're just meeting people for the first time, acquaintances. Yes. Are you running uh, a little personality or communication test in your mind with that person? It's an occupational hazard. And I, I typically go one step further. Uh, I say, hey, I'll send you a link to take the Clifton Strengths. Send me your five strengths. Uh, one of my strengths in the Clifton Strengths is called input. And that's kind of the collecting, you know, just collecting everything. It's the geek strength. So over the years, I have worked with and workshops or coached over 15,000 people. Um, so, yeah, it's an occupational hazard. Do people pick up on it if you don't communicate it to them that you're doing it? Like, is the story uh, going on in your head? And a lot of the times they think it's a magic trick. You know, you start asking questions and, you know, I come at it. 
asking certain questions about tendencies or certain phrases they might use or how their closet might be organized or what TV show they like to watch. And, uh, you know, and part of it is just my, you know, it's just extra. It's like, it's like a, an athlete just continually exercising and trying and seeing if, if it works. We've got a question here uh, from a viewer on Facebook, Mia Bianca, who asks, any advice on how to choose a business to start with? So I'm assuming that question wow. is, you know, based on your personality, on your communication type, would you choose one business or a style of business over another? I'm not sure I'm a great one to answer that because I didn't go after chasing this business or the entrepreneur. In 2000, when the dot-com crash hit, I was a newly minted vice president having moved my family from Washington, D.C. to Texas. We lost 70% of our revenue within three months. And then one day I come in the office and the owner says, it takes my 10-year contract, rips it up and says, we don't need a vice president. We need sales. So you can either leave now or go back into sales. So that began, um, that opened an opportunity for me to pursue something, which was writing my first book. And I began a parallel track, kind of a side side hustle back in 2000, which then opened new doors, which then opened other doors. And, um, you know, so I think it's a little bit of the hero's journey. Um, I don't know if your audience is familiar with kind of that classic model where you're minding your own business, but you're not fully living to your potential. And then you get hit upside the head with life. And then, uh, and then you got to go through the struggles of figuring out what's next and trying to find out that next better version of yourself. And fortunately for me, part of my model of success has always been surrounding myself with a strong network of colleagues, friends, you know, tight friends that I could take some of these journeys together with. So I would say the most important thing is have some really good colleagues around that can either hold you to your best or if you take the risk, can help you navigate through that risk. If we turn our attention to uh, mental mindset in general, irrespective of your natural communication style or your uh, natural um, personality. Right. Um, I, I see here that you did some improv back in the day. Is that right? You did improv? <laughs> yes, I took an intro course, eight weeks of improv. Um, and, uh, you know, I wasn't great at I learned a lot. I was the oldest person, the only business person, uh, and it was really uncomfortable, but I learned a lot. So mentioning that, referencing some improv and maybe a few other things, like what are some, I guess, mental exercises, personality exercises, yeah. communication exercises someone can do irrespective of what their natural style is? Well, so the big thing I took away from improv was primarily in the workshops and especially the conflict resolution workshops. Um, in those workshops, your anxiety can amp up because you're not sure what's going to happen. You're not sure it's going to be a success or failure. But if you can be what they say in the moment, be really not trying to think ahead or try to come up with a solution, but be in that respond or or play into wh whatever the other person is coming up with, uh, not trying to resist it, but trying to use it as material in the conversation. Be present, in other words. That's the hardest thing uh, that I had in improv, but it really, really helped in the workshops. Um, you tend to go in very prepared but over time, I learned to go in prepared so that I could go off script comfortably and be comfortable with it, to not try to control it, but try to create whatever comes out of it. Um, and that's called being present, being in the moment, the yes and, you know, that sets kind of a mindset of playing with or being playful with uh, curiosity. If someone's really angry, uh, I learned to be curious about it. Huh. 
the wonder in, instead of being defensive. And uh, those were some of the things I picked up out of improv. When you referenced yes and, that's uh, as opposed to yes but, correct? Correct. correct. Yeah. As soon as I hear the word but, I it, it seems like we're in a we're in combat then, doesn't it? Yeah. And what you're what you're really referring to is it shifts the energy. And that's one of the things I learned in improv is really try to feel the energy in the room. Where is the energy? Is it quiet? Is it dead? Is it agitated? Is it anxious? Uh, is it restless? And then learn how to to work with that energy and 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 experience that energy instead of just going into content. Um, and you're right, the energy is everything, whether it's with an audience or a presentation. But it's it's really hard to uh, be in that mindset. One of the things that I read uh, recently was that all communication or all persuasion is really only 7% what you say and 93% how you say it. Is that your understanding? And if it is, yeah. can you just clarify and explain that? Well, um, I've heard the same, but I'll refer to a new field called neurocardiology. It's the science of the central nervous system. And we have the sympathetic side, which is the on button, and it's part of the vigilance, the fight, flight, perform, and then the parasympathetic, which is the kind of the rest. That signal, uh, they're considering it another form of a brain, an intelligence. It is so intuitive picking up on people's energy, uh, whether you're safe, whether you're happy, and it's all nonverbal. Uh, so tone and texture and timing, uh, your central nervous system is picking up on all of that. And it's a hundred times stronger than the signals that your prefrontal cortex sends to the heart. Um, and that's why in that agitated state, uh, you start losing clarity. Um, uh, and, and, you know, uh, if, if you're amped up, uh, you know that you don't think clearly you lose your keys. If you're in a hurry and you lose your keys, it's even harder. That's that central nervous system, uh, overtaking the brain. So, I don't know where the, the number comes from, but I get at it through a different means. And I would agree that that tone, posture, all have more impact over the content. And I would argue that there are uh, personality types that are very logic based. So they, they will try to yep. fight battles or make a point with logic. Yep. Um, but as anyone who's been in a romantic relationship will know, for trying to fight any kind of battle with logic is is often a losing a losing battle and and then you know even if you win if you you know quote unquote win in your mind you still <laughs> lose because the other person feels hurt that they've lost right uh so a win becomes a loss uh so uh, so in that sense i guess there's an argument to say let's try to get out of winning logical battles or trying to be logical or there's a time and place to be logical, but that's not not necessarily the only modality that we have in order to resolve disputes. Yeah, totally. Right. Yeah, and that gets back to, do you want to be right because we feel right, or do you want to be effective? Um, and again, if you're stressed or amped up, you'll go to that default mode. So if your default mode is logic, uh, stress will drive you even more to it. If your default mode is to kind of chit chat your way out of it, talk your way, you'll go that way as well. So we were uh, referencing the Swannies blue light blocking glasses before, uh, and you said that you wear yours at at, uh, at night time, just on sleep and best practices in sleep. How important it is sleep uh, in terms of staff or colleague happiness or, cl- or well-being or clarity? How important is sleep to workplace functionality? Well, uh, current research, we just finished uh, a, a book that's called Whole, uh, What Teachers Need to Help Students Thrive, came out in March of this year. It really looked at the phenomenon on stress and lack of sleep and, and the impact stress has on disrupting sleep 
and what that does to you during the day. And at least in the United States, they project somewhere between 65 to 70 percent of people are sleep deprived. So that sleep deprivation means that you're functioning. uh, Not only are you functioning in a more stressed mode, but also your cognitive load, your ability to take on more load is compromised as well. So stress leads to disruption of sleep. Disruption of sleep leads to kind of a vicious cycle of stimulants during the day and and you're back at it. Uh, The research shows that, you know, lack of sleep compromises your immune system. Compromised immune system leads to unhealthy coping behaviors. Those unhealthy coping behaviors lead to metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome leads to chronic disease. Um, So I think sleep's kind of the the uh, silver bullet, the secret weapon. It, and it has been for me too. Um, in uh, 2016, I was one of those individuals that prided themselves in going to bed 10, 30, 11 at night, getting up 5, 30 or 6. And then, you know, working out, going through the day. And then I started reading about athletes and the sleep they were getting and something called overtraining syndrome. So I got two devices. I got a whoop strap and an aura ring and it just opened my eyes. I had adjusted myself. I had, I had accepted being tired as optimal. I I was suboptimal, but thought it was normal. And after a few nights and then weeks of seeing what full recovery felt like, um, it was transformational for me. So we've been we've been on that road ever since. In fact, last week I gave a webinar on uh, on examining sleep and making sleep a key habit, and and so it's it's central to all of our executive coaching now. So, what is your sleep routine, Rex? <laughs> My sleep routine. Uh, so around six thirty or seven, uh, my wife and I will watch some episode together using my Swannies and we'll watch it on a computer screen because the intensity of a TV is, is much higher. Um, and then we'll shut it down around eight 30 at night. I will do some journaling from about eight 30 to nine. Uh, and we call that a digital sunset. And we adopted that from Brian Johnson, who, uh, has his own, he's got a, a, a website called optimize.me. So I picked that up from him. And then uh, I go to bed. I uh, got my Bose earbuds. I have my, you know, my eye shades, dark room, 68 degrees, and get into bed. And I allow my, uh, my bands to tell me what the optimal time. And I really try to hit within the nine to nine thirty range each night when I can. And with the quarantine that we've had in the United States, that's been easy to do. Uh, And then my optimal sleep, the amount of sleep is seven hours and 23 minutes. And then you add to that your strain for the day, any sleep that, and you subtract your naps, and that comes up with how much time you need to be in bed. So I, I'm very disciplined about going by that. And um, every day I get up around six o'clock in the morning, and that's the routine. Mm. Uh, alcohol. I help people uh, quit alcohol in one of my other businesses, mm. uh, and not necessarily what society mm. might deem to be an alcoholic, even just you know, occasional drinkers or modest drinkers. Uh, have you seen any research um, to suggest that reducing or quitting alcohol can also increase uh, work performance, team prefer- performance, organization performance? Yeah. And and so I measured with my with the WHOOP strap, and it showed me that in uh, five occasions of having alcohol before bedtime, my REM sleep dropped 41%. So those were the numbers. Now, the research, if you read Matthew Walker's book or uh, Smart Sleep, they recommend no alcohol prior to two hours before bed. Um, 
And for me, it seems like I can have one glass of wine two, two and a half hours before bed. My experience for me, now this is just for me, if I have more than one glass of wine, uh, even if it's before two hours, it'll affect my sleep. So I have to be very careful. And if I have a glass of wine, I will measure and see, okay, um, how did, how did I do? And, and so, so anyway, that's my, that's my experience with it. Have you ever gone into an organization as a <clears throat> consultant and you ask questions about specifically around their alcohol intake and ask or invited people to either reduce it or quit it and that they've seen a dramatic uh, impact in their performance, anything like that? So there was a company in Florida that um, I discussed making sleep their number one professional development habit for the leadership team. And that, that evolved because they were moving towards a health and well-being culture. And I introduced them to a well-being consultant to help them change their benefits package, mandatory vacations, cutting work, cutting emails out at the end on Fridays till Sunday, but people were not adopting the habits. So with the leaders, I just went around the table and say, asked, how many hours are you working? Are you working on Saturdays? And had each person tell me when they went to bed, when they got up, and that was the problem. They were all working still 60, 70 hours a, a week, uh, working on weekends. And then we asked about alcohol consumption. So we got all of them a whoop strap for a period of time. And I was allowed to put them on a dashboard like you would for an athletic team. And I monitored their sleep, their recovery, the quality of their sleep, their exercise for several months. And we saw a dramatic improvement in their heart rate variability, in their resting heart rate, in their shift to how much time, in their consistency of when they went to bed. Uh, you almost need to have something like that, those commitment devices, and do it collectively. Um, or there's just too much pressure on the outside of other people and peers to get in the way. So this particular company really cut it's, they were known for having a really good time uh, when they came together and they cut all, they didn't cut it out completely, but they cut it dramatically. Is there um, evidence to suggest that taking uh, at least one day off of work per week or two or three or a half day or one night? Mm -hmm. Uh, dramatically improves the performance of, of a human being in the workplace. So you mentioned there that people were, were still working over the weekends. There's a lot of people that, that that say that they love their work, they've built their work into their lifestyle, their lifestyle is their work, they don't need to take time off, they enjoy working. Yeah. They're, uh, <clears throat> is there any anything to suggest pros and cons to that? Well, absolutely. I mean, athlete. So I'm a certified tennis professional. There's no athlete in their right mind would play and work hard every single day. You've got to have recovery time. Uh, and even the top athletes like Roger Federer or Tom Brady with, in football or Justin Verlander or LeBron James are now, they're sleeping 10 to 12 hours a day during competitive seasons, and they all take breaks. We've heard of the word sabbaticals. Um, sabbaticals are there for a reason so you can recharge and refresh. In our household, uh, we take all day Sunday. Uh, we, start, we start Saturday evening to begin shutting down, getting our minds uh, shifted. And then all day Sunday, we just take it easy. We read, we reflect, we talk, we share, we have some family time. Uh, and it took time to build that in, uh, but it's become the thing that we look forward to the most, that we're recharged the most. And I don't have direct research on that, um, but I know it. it's the rhythm, the people that I follow the most have some kind of either weekly or quarterly, just, just get away, break, reflect, uh, it, 
today, this afternoon, I spent three hours just thinking and journaling. Um, and out of that, things and creative thoughts come that you, that I would never have because I'm crowding it out too much by calendar and checklists and the drive to pr productivity. Uh, we put a, a link there in the YouTube uh, in the YouTube comments. There is a free webinar that focuses on sleep uh, and living younger. Uh, it's at rexmiller.com, and you can go and check oh, out everything about Rex at rexmiller.com. But there is a, a free webinar there that we've put posted in there, and we've also popped that in the uh, the Facebook chat uh, as well. Uh, Rod Viaje has actually uh, has posted a comment here in Facebook saying prioritizing sleep is the way to get results. He hasn't asked a question, but um, I guess you could confirm that, that Rod's on the money there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's step number one. In fact, that's the very first step in that webinar. When I recap, value sleep, make it a priority. Um, the badge of honor, and James, I don't know if you were growing up, and the badge of honor was how little sleep you got, You know, bragging that I pulled an all-nighter or I worked on this project. And changing what we reward is part of uh, shifting that priority to sleep. Just on the just on the productivity uh, element again, you said that you start to shut down on a Saturday evening. So does that mean that you're giving yourself 24 hours and then you're starting to think about work again on Sunday evening? Or do you shut down on Saturday and you don't even think about it again until Monday? No, I, I start thinking... I don't get into productivity mode. I start thinking, imagining what the next week will be like, thinking about certain individuals that are important to me uh, throughout the week, uh, large goals. So I don't get into very specifics, but I start putting that together on, on Sunday evening after dinner. So we work, uh, we kind of chill through the day. We have a nice dinner together. And then around 6.30 or 7, I spend about an hour, hour and a half just thinking through what the next week is going to be like. It's, it's a little bit of a visualizing exercise. Um, and I find that helps me uh, get prepared, not get so far in the weeds where it's going to keep my mind active at night, but enough to have a, a visual roadmap and feel at peace about what I'm going to do that next week. We've got a couple of questions that are coming in here on Facebook and YouTube, but just before I get to those, I'd like to ask you about journaling. You mentioned that you you journal for about 30 minutes. So what are you actually writing down? Do you have specific questions that you're asking yourself and that you're answering, or are you just writing whatever comes to mind? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. Sometimes I'll just stand there and the journal will be open for 20 minutes or so, and I'm thinking, okay, what can I write? But usually something triggers. It may be a comment from my kids, especially during this time of the pandemic and the social unrest and something they might say, maybe something that I read, uh, maybe a conversation from the last week. I also do sketching and I learned to do sketching. Uh, an individual by the name of Kathy Hutchison really got me involved in doing kind of graphic journaling. Uh, so I do a lot of that as well. And I find that getting into that sketching, cartooning mode, uh, taking ideas and concepts really loosens my thinking up and helps me connect the dots instead of just doing linear journaling. Uh, Elena Frederick says I, on YouTube, thank you for your comment, Elena, says, I find that after a day or two off, I'm so much more productive. Thank you for the reminder. And then has a question for those who are workaholics, do you have any quick tips for making sure you get the me slash refresh time? Yeah, that's a great question because having coached with the Clifton Strengths, everybody recovers so differently. A uh, good example is that my son is wired to be very social and I'm wired to kind of go into my head. We did a workshop together uh, several years ago. And so he was behind the scenes, not talking or interacting. We get in the car to go back to the hotel room. I was engaged in giving the workshop all day and I was silent. So I was in that recovery mode. And uh, Nathan says, dad, why do you go from engaged dad in the workshop to boring dad in the car? Uh, so it was a reminder to me that the way he recovers 
was in conversation, connection, joking around. And so some people may recover by cleaning out the cupboard, you know, something that's discre- totally discretionary, but it makes them feel productive or they may go into their head or they may want to go and see a show or an entertainment. So that's what I've learned in coaching so many people is that there's not a one way to recover mode, um, but find what works best for you and then make it sacred, whatever it is, make, you know, uh, get some commitment devices or ways that you just do it. Is there anything uh, to suggest that taking uh, a week off or a month off or two weeks off or uh, can be beneficial to someone as opposed to um, I'm imagining probably myself, quite frankly, as an entrepreneur yeah. who uh, finds it very challenging to just completely and utterly shut off. Uh, I, I seem to build in little breaks throughout my week. So I'm not necessarily working nine to five. I might I might work, you know, nine, nine to 12 and then not work from 12 until five and then work from five until nine at night. And 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 so I tell myself, oh, I'm not working all the time because I've built blocks of four or five hours of rest in between. So is there anything regarding what might be optimal in that, in that sense? Yeah. Again, I think depending on how you're wired and if if you feel rejuvenated, there's an energy part of this, too, which I'm sure you find is that on rhythm, off rhythm. Cal Newport, Cal Newport talks about ultradian rhythms. You know, we have these peaks and valleys of energy throughout the day. So I try to manage my energy. What I find, though, is that when I do go away and there's a couple of places I go for retreat, it'll take me a couple days <laughs> before I feel completely unplugged and uh, and the anxiousness will go away to feel like I don't have to do anything. I'm not driven by anything in particular. So I think it's healthy. Uh, I don't do it enough in terms of those longer retreats, but it, it does take me two, two plus days to uh, just kind of totally unwind. So the idea of going away and taking a full week off to most entrepreneurs who own businesses w- would be like, I can't do that. What are you crazy? Like, right. I got a business. I got a business to run here. But it seems to be that the that evidence suggests that doing that, quote unquote, forcing yourself to do that, probably is going to be more beneficial for you in the in the long run. Absolutely. You know, it, it's the difference between going deep or wide. You know, those times off allow you to go deep and reflect why you're doing what you're doing. You know, I I don't know how you find it, but I get so pulled into the activity of delivering work, creating new content that, you know, I just get caught in that uh, momentum or, and then unless I pull back, like, like the whole COVID uh, pandemic, uh, I assumed that my way, my business model was to get on a plane every Monday, fly to a client, do a workshop, do a keynote, do something like that. All that disappeared um, in March. I mean, 90% of my revenue just disappeared. Without the time to, to be forced to stop, I wouldn't have created the studio that you see now. Um, the considering, oh, I can do things differently. I can create my service into content. You can't think like that if you're always on the run. And uh, so, you know, it, it was a blessing in disguise for me and for my business to have this. And I probably wouldn't be doing it this way uh, if I didn't, if I wasn't forced to have to stop. Uh, I have a question here from, uh, from Meg Rivera, who says, I'd love to get eight hours of sleep, but I always wake up before my alarm. What can I do about that? Well, first of all, some sleep experts would say it's a good thing because you're waking up according to your body's rhythm. But what I would suggest is that maybe you look at the front end to see if there's an optimal time, if if you should be going to bed earlier. So one of my questions would be, what time are you going to bed? Uh, Dr. Royzen, the chief wellness officer for the Cleveland Clinic, says 
that the sleep you get before 2 a.m. is your best and healthiest sleep. So if you can get one or two cycles, and cycles are typically about 90 minutes, before 2 a.m., that's your healthiest sleep. So I would look at the front end uh, and let yourself wake up naturally like that without an alarm. Um, you me mentioned before that you like to watch an episode of a television show before you then go and journal. Is there anything to suggest that uh, watching a television show or scrolling through your phone in the minutes before you go to sleep is detrimental or effective? It kills uh, it kills sleep. Absolutely kills sleep. Um, and James, I already know you know this, but <clears throat> the blue light from your computer, or from your TV, is telling your body it is noontime. And that's peak peak flow of cortisol in your body. That's, again, that sympathetic nervous system, that fight, flight, on peak performance hormones. It takes about two hours once you shut it off for the, the night crew, so to speak, to go away and for the melatonin to begin coming in, to begin making yourself sleepy to uh, to slow your heart rate to lower your body temperature um, so even even looking at your phone your phone shouldn't even be in your your bedroom at night even looking at it where you know we've all read that email that just amps us up there's social media is another evil too in in terms of good sleep so the the whole digital screen world we're in kills sleep. Uh, one of my clients, and it's in the in that uh, webinar I give on living younger, he recorded that when he doesn't wear your glasses, the Swannies, at night, uh, his his REM cycle goes from fifteen minutes. Uh, when he wears the Swanee, it jumps up to forty five minutes to an hour and a half. That's the difference that he's experiencing between wearing the glasses and not, you know, blocking out that blue light or not. Just throw your pair of Swannies over the top again for me, Rex. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. So just tell, describe how you, how and when and under what circumstances you put your Swannies on each night. Well, so we'll, uh, Dinner will be over. My wife and I will say, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to read together or watch something together? And we'll say, okay, let's see what's on Amazon Prime or the Disney, whatever it is. And uh, we primarily do it so we can be just sitting next to each other. And then I'll take my laptop and we'll put it on a little pillow in between the two of us, put on the glasses, and then we'll watch uh, an episode. And only one episode, because what I found that even with these on, if we watch 90, and they're typically 45 minutes, if we, if I'm watching 90 minutes uh, of anything, it does affect my sleep. I will get amped up. Now, here's a biohack that I learned too. <clears throat> uh, there's a book that came out in the 1980s, Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. And one of the arguments is that the brain waves when you're watching shows is similar to theta waves. Those are sleep waves. So I started measuring with my aura ring and my whoop what was happening if we watched a show and I just got very relaxed. And guess what? It registers as a nap, not the whole time, but a good bit of it. Uh, so that's a little bit of a biohack <laughs> that I ran across um, in terms of, gee, if you let your body get in that relaxed state and you're watching something, those theta waves that you're generating actually slow your heartbeat enough where it's re where you're in that parasympathetic mode. So what you're suggesting is it's actually it might actually be okay to watch some television, uh, like a drama or something for 30, 45 minutes at the end of the day, as long of course as long, of course, if you're watching if you're wearing a pair of blue light blocking glasses, yes. Yeah, but also realize we shut it off at 8.30 and then we go to analog mode to wind the mind down, journaling or conversation or whatever it is. We'll just kind of relax, breathe, not disciplined breathing, but we'll just relax and breathe a bit, 
talk, but no, no digital stimulation, a good hour before we're actually in bed. Yeah. Well, we're just about to release our uh, Swannies. Uh, let me just grab. Yeah. There we go. We're just about to release our anti-blue light LED bulbs for better oh, sleep. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and I've been try, trialing them out this past uh, yeah. past week or so. And uh, you have a very you have very impressive lighting behind you at the moment, Rex. Rex, uh, this is the the upcoming Swanic light bulb, and um, my partner and I put them in our uh, bed lamps, uh, and it is it's a complete game changer. It like the, instead of having this nasty big overhead light that's just kind of shining down on us, this is a very calming uh, light that comes out and puts us into a sleepy kind of mode. There's no blue light in there, so it's not going to be I love uh, affecting it. melatonin production. Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously we're wearing the Swanies glasses here, so we know the importance of blocking the blue light. This actually gives you an ability to to, to sit in light without any of the blue light. So Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I'll just go here, uh, just as we start to wrap this up here, just a reminder that you can uh, check out uh, all of Rex Miller's wonderful stuff over at uh, rexmiller.com. He has a free webinar there that focuses on sleep. Just a reminder that Rex is the author of the book, The Healthy Workplace Nudge, How Healthy People, Culture, and Buildings Lead to High Performance. Uh, thank you for the questions that we've had coming in uh, so far. We've got a few comments here. Elena says, I love the idea of drawing versus writing for journaling. Um, awesome, Rex. I never thought of cleaning uh, as that me time. That is very me. I like to have silent tasks that I clear in my head. Um, we've got, uh, Melanie says, I've got four kids and they also take my weekends. I'd love to get some of that me time. Uh, <laughs> any, uh, any advice for parents, for parents of, uh, of young ones on getting real relaxing time, Rex? Have good friends that will help you with your kids. Um, yeah, that, and especially now, you know, I'm coaching people and finding that sometimes they have one of their little ones on their knee while I'm coaching it's really stressful to be 24 seven with all of your family and kids. So I don't, you know, I don't have a good solution for you. I wish I did. Uh, but you really do need those breaks. Um, and if family can help, man, make a deal with your family to help you out. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you a couple quick fire questions, if I may. Um, uh, actually, actually, there was one other question there I wanted to uh, to get to, which I may have skipped over. A uh, gentleman was asking, saying that I think he was in his 50s and wanted to start a business, but it was asking, did you feel that maybe it was too late for him? Is it advisable to start at that time? Um, everything, well, almost everything is now online. So I started my business at 58. <laughs> so uh, I'm 65 now. And, uh, you know, I, I would never look back at it. Um, you know, it, it was, it was the right thing to do. And, you know, there, who, who's to say when is the right time, but having the right idea, having the right network, if you can build kind of a side hustle to prototype and test your concept, I consult with a lot of startups and a lot of times they have a great idea but they don't have it market tested. They haven't tested whether it's a really validated need, even though it might be a great idea. So um, that's the biggest mistake I find with the entrepreneurs that try to launch. Uh, they don't have enough cash flow or capital for runway. They don't have a team of people who know what they're doing or have done it before. Uh, the E-Myth is a great book. If you're thinking about being an entrepreneur before you go out and do it, read the E-Myth Revisited uh, and think twice. Uh, but I started mine more. Mine was a eight year side hustle, you know, writing a couple books, testing, getting an audience. And then, you know, I was ready to go. Mm. You said you're 65, Rex. Is that right? Yes. Mm hmm. Well, you look like you're in terrific shape, at least the way that I'm seeing you on your camera here. You feel that way? 
I am. Yeah. I, uh, there's an assessment you can take called the real age assessment that was developed by Dr. Roizen. And it'll measure, uh, you, it, you put in some biometrics plus your lifestyle, measures your chronological age versus your biological age. And that's where that whole living younger title came from. It came from taking that assessment about 10 years ago and determining that I would continue to do the things to help me live younger. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in the best shape that I've been since my thirties. Um, I'm playing the best tennis I've played since my thirties. And what do you attribute that to? I mean, I'm sure it's a number of things, lifestyle choices, but if you could just summarize some of them, what, what would it be? Uh, doing a little bit every day, you know, so, uh, shifting the habits away from the things that were killing me like sugar, lack of sleep, uh, not exercising. That was kind of the early part of it. Uh, then learning how to do things that made me healthier and stronger, but, uh, taking kind of that incremental approach, doing one physical life change habit a year and one uh, emotional, mental life change habit a year at the first of the year. And then I set January aside as a reset. It's a dry January. It's a media, no media during January, reset priorities, pick one habit. And that kind of sets the tone for the rest of the year. Now I'm not perfect on those habits, by the way, but that's been the goal. And incrementally over time, I've continued to feel better, uh, and I think the three things were the sleep, uh, the low sugar diet, more plant-based diet, and then the consistent exercise. I have a, I think my, my two biggest health concerns at the moment are I have a lower back pain mm. and I am prone to gout attacks, which is ironic because I don't drink alcohol and many, many people who yeah. get gout attacks uh, is from drinking alcohol, but I have a high high amounts of uric acid in my in my body in relation to my lower back pain do you have any flexibility uh advice or tips or anything that you that have you experienced any pain how did you overcome it well uh i've been extremely fortunate you know i i did have rotator cuff surgery about 25 years ago uh in high school i did injure my back but that was kind of a um, a long recovery period. I, I've had friends who've had back problems where yoga has helped them. Um, and uh, I'm not a specialist in, in back areas, but some chiropractic I know is helpful. So um, I'm not sure, James, what you've pursued in the past, but could be chiropractic, could be yoga. Um, and, um, you know, it, and that's kind of outside it's above my pay grade in terms of uh, recommending on back back pain. Well, Rex, thank you so much for your time. We so appreciate yeah, uh, you giving thank us you. your words of expertise. And thank you to all those who left comments and asked questions, Elena and uh, Maya and Rod and Melanie and Meg and uh, Mel. Thank you so much for leaving your comments. Uh, and just a reminder, you can go to rexmiller.com to learn more. Uh, Rex, thank you for rocking your Swanee's glasses. Thank you yeah, for giving welcome. us your words of expertise and guidance yeah. on, on today's call. Any thank anything, any me. final kind of sentiment to, to leave to our viewers here? Uh, no, thank you so much. You know, a little bit every day, well, it's kind of like compound interest. It'll add up. It'll make a difference. It'll transform you over time. Rex Miller, thank you so much for your time. Your bet. Thank you. Take care, James. <laughs>